My guest tonight is a true game changer whose big playability could turn a game in an instant. Born in Louisiana, Edward Earl Reed Jr. would go from the banks of the Mississippi River to the record books, winning a national championship with the Miami Hurricanes, leading the NFL in interceptions for three seasons, and becoming a Super Bowl champion. But before he was named the NFL's Defensive Player of the Year, did you know he played eight different positions on his high school football team, was a champion javelin thrower, and began mentoring kids during his NFL rookie year? Tonight, we'll learn what makes this undeniable icon who he is, a man who once said, if we surround ourselves with the right people in the right environment, our opportunity for success increases greatly. Please welcome the NFL's ultimate ball hawk, Ed Reed. <laughs> How you doing? How you doing, Joe? Right on, man. Have a seat. <laughs> well, my friend, thank you for coming. No problem. Thank you for being here. And uh, in advance, thank you for telling what I think is is an awesome story and oh. and just I think something that we can all learn from you were born in 1978 yes in Metairie Louisiana and then eventually life in St. Rose yes. so so tell me about life in Louisiana in the late 70s early 80s you know um, growing up in Louisiana in Metairie was was a little tough you know five minutes from New Orleans one bedroom apartment with five kids you know my mom and my dad were working hard they wasn't at home as much. They was always at, you know, at work. My dad was a shipbuilder. He worked at Avondale Shipyard. And my mom worked at a restaurant at the time. So it was me and my brothers half the time, or you were outside, you know, in your environment, your neighborhood, and drug-infested environment in Shrewsbury, Louisiana, where I grew up at. My dad was working hard, you know, to move us out of that neighborhood. Your dad, your mom, they were working so hard mm -hmm because they wanted better for you and your yeah. brothers. It made me understand a little bit more about taking steps to provide for your family. Cause my dad used to talk about it all the time. Your responsibility is to take care of home first. You know, as a kid, nine, 10 years old, you don't really comprehend that. You don't really understand it as much, but dad is always working. You know, and when my dad was working, I was walking to practice. You know, I didn't have a ride. And when I look up in the stands as I played baseball, my dad wasn't there. My mom wasn't there, they was at work. And I'm walking home 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night by myself. At that time, was sports kind of your outlet? Is that is that what you looked forward to? Is, is that what brought the smile to your face? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting you say that. You know, was it an outlet? It was an outlet, but you know, for me, especially nowadays with parents working all the time, I feel like sports is a kid's job. I feel like kids should play sports. I feel like that was my job at the time. We grew up in the sports house. That's what you do, that's what you're good at. Sports is in our blood. My dad was super athlete, probably best athlete in my family. You, you think know? he was a better athlete than you? His friends let, them, let me know every time that he was better than me. <laughs> every time. Like you should have seen your daddy back Yeah, you just won the Super Bowl. You, your dad was better than you, it don't matter. <laughs> You know, my dad played softball, baseball, and I was always there on Tuesday or Thursday nights and Sundays. That was family day at the park. My dad was blue, they blue collar guys who took pride in a softball game to play on Sundays. And my mom and them out there cheering. This is me as a kid, like, you know, you got all the wives out here and the audience got their husband names on their shirt and you know, you got the peanut man walking in the stands, you know, peanut man make you hump and bump. You know, you got those things going on. As a kid, you see family, you see your dad out there playing, you see them competing, you know, and, and, and just having fun. And the joy from it. And that joy that one day, and then we go back to the weekend, it's, it's hard work, but for that one day, you know, it's everything. It's a championship, it's a loss. And I mean, obviously it was a gift, but I didn't know that. I didn't know as a kid that I was gonna be in the NFL. You dream for it, but you end up in the outfield shagging softballs for your dad, not thinking that's gonna help you to be one of the best safeties. You know, that's just you having fun. You know, when I got older, I looked back and I'm like, man, all those balls I was just trying to catch, 
you know, that was preparing me for years later, you know, the hand-eye coordination. You can catch that little ball, man. You know, you can catch football at ease. And I would imagine that was also, it's twofold. Not only are you tracking fly balls, but it was a way for you to bond with your dad. Oh, yeah, no doubt. No doubt about it. I mean, my dad always had me on his hip. You know, I love baseball. I didn't, I didn't pursue it as much, but... I mean, my dad always had me on the ship. I wanted to be like him. My dad was playing sports, so follow your dad, you know? So, I mean, that my dad's work ethic was an example like no other. Tell me about Ben Parquet. Oh, man. Uh, you know, everybody who sat in that chair has had different people at different stages of their life yeah. guide them or yeah. say the right thing at the right time yes, or... Sir you know, in your case, really champion you mm -hmm. to the school because there was some talk that you might have to repeat eighth grade. Yes. He comes talk to me. Actually, he hits me in the chest first. Mr. Parkett got a way of smacking kids in the chest to get their attention. And it got my attention, no doubt, because I'm looking at this man like, what are you doing? Like, who are you and why are you hitting on Why'd me? Why'd you just hit yeah, me? Exactly. But, you know, and he, he told me, he was like, do you want to go to high school? I was like, yes, sir. He was like, well, you know you're behind in your school. And I'm like, okay, so what am I going to do? He was like, well, let's take a visit to the high school. So we took a visit to the high school. I go to meet the football players. And after practice, a couple guys walk up to me. And after meeting those guys and seeing the facilities, I'm like, wow, yeah, I want to come here. And he was like, well, they're starting a program called Transitional Night. You can imagine going to high school and being in the transitional night program that's which really eight and a half and all your peers bullying you as we say now, you know, and he, he, was, he was just every week or every month making sure he's checking on me to make sure I'm doing the right thing. And once I got to high school, you know, it's more people there who are trying to push me to be better. When he got to Destrehan High School, you met a woman, great woman named Jean Hall. Ms. Hall is the secretary at Destrehan High School, you know, and I think it, it changed when I missed 19 days of school. And I only had like two more I could miss. And she pulled me to the side. You know, Mr. Parquet coming here all the time for you. I could hear her voice now. <laughs> and um, she's like, you gonna mess this up? The opportunity? I'm like, who is this lady? <laughs> you know, why is she concerned? And she was like, I want you to come to my house with Rondell and all those guys. They're gonna be studying. It's like, all right. Went over there, started studying, did my work. And that led to two, three weeks. You know, me going over there, just hanging out. We all eating, playing basketball and one day, me and her in there about 12.30, and I'm writing the paper, just finishing up, and I'm, I need to go home, but I'm like, Ms. Hall, I'm just too tired. Don't worry about it. I go in the morning. And the next morning, we riding to my house, and I'm like, you know, Ms. Hall, I probably should just stay. And she's like, what? It's like, stay at your house. I think that would be the best thing for me. I won't miss school, because you riding there every day anyway. And I can get my study. I can get my studies done. She thought about it. She was like, ask your dad, ask your parents. Let me know what they say. The hardest thing was for me to bring that to my dad. That's what I was always wondering. What, it's one thing from, <laughs> from this side. Yeah. Yeah. It's another from where you're from. No saying, doubt. I'm leaving. No doubt. Why was it so hard to tell your dad, mm -hmm. your, your idol? Yeah, I was like, dad, you know, I got, I got an opportunity, I think. I think I need to go live with Ms. Hall. It's like, who is Ms. Hall? He, she's a secretary at a high school, and um, that's where I'll be going to study at. It's like, okay. He's like, you think this is going to help you? I said, yeah. He's like, all right. It's like, really? <laughs> it's like, yeah. Now, meanwhile, the house is only five minutes from each other. I could actually walk to Ms. Hall House. Yeah, but it could, be, it, it, <laughs> but it, it could have been five minutes. It could have yeah. been 500 miles. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, there, there's a divide now you're putting there where yeah, you're no saying, I, I feel like I'm better off mm -hmm. over here. And it, I think it says a lot mm -hmm. from your dad's perspective that he said, okay. Oh, yeah, no doubt. You know, I think it, it definitely affected the family, probably my younger brothers more than anything. But I was my worst opponent. 
missing school. So I talked to my dad, and he said, yeah, and go back to Miss Hall. And now I have two dads and two mothers. And most people can't say that. Some people can't say they have a dad. Some can't say they have a mother. You had somebody now to answer to. Exactly. Exactly. You know, you did your homework. You know, I could, my dad can ask me that, but he ain't looking at it, you know, with all honesty, because he ain't, he's not getting home until later. Now they're asking you, let me see it. I needed that. I needed that. I, I feel like it's more with you. That I want it out, man. I want it, I want it away, you know, for me in high school. You know, um, I was around people who didn't care, you know, what you did away from football. You know, if you were in the street, they supported it, so to say. You know, yeah, go ahead and do that. You know, sell that, you know. What when you say that, that, what are we, is this? Talking drugs. You know, this was, this was, it actually was worse of a drug neighborhood than the one I was in, you know, because everybody sort of did it, you know, and, and, and for, for a young black man growing up at the time, that's what it was about. How can you make a couple nickels or two to buy yourself a bag of potato chips to feed yourself? So you, you described it once as crabs in a bucket, like everybody was kind of clawing at you, trying to drag you down. Yeah. Did you get grief from your friends? Like, you, where are you going? What do you mean? What the hell's happened to you, Ed? Why are you leaving us behind? Did, did you get it from that side? Yeah, I got it from them, you know, but it didn't matter. It's not your life, not your opportunity. You can't play ball like I can, so. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I knew I had to go to summer school. You know, so I was like, hey, man, y'all can have all the extra stuff. It's about school now. I had no other choice. So when you got to high school, what position are you, are you playing? What, I mean, we know Ed Reed, the safety, but, but my God, it seemed like you did literally everything. everything. Yeah, I played everything. Punter. Yep. Kicker. Yep. Some quarterback. Yep. Wide receiver. Yep. Safety. Yep. <laughs> Linebacker. Sometimes. <laughs> What's left? I punt return. Punt returner. Kick returner. Punt block. I blocked punts in co in high school. You hear people in the state in the stadium, literally hollering, "They're gonna kill that boy," because I was everywhere, offense to defense, offense to defense to special teams. But I loved it. I loved it. I love to play the game, and I wanted my team to win. Whatever it took for my team to win, if I was in shape, if I could walk and run, and I was all right, I would play. But all of this, I assume, is because you know in your heart you're good enough to play. Oh, yeah, it was that time. There's certain requirements in 97, 96 that you needed, that you needed to get to college. Curtis Johnson and Chuck Pagano came and visited me. Bush Davis came and visited me in high school from the University of Miami, right? Chuck Pagano <laughs> took me in the room, and he's like, how are your grades? I'm like, Coach, they're okay. You know, they, they all right. He's like, well, you know you got to meet certain requirements, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, all right. Didn't know that stuff like that, but here we go. So you got to have 17. You got to have, like, a... 2.8 GPA or something like that. I think I was on a bubble or something close to it, but I, I had to take this ACT. I took the ACT like 10 times. It was the worst test ever, you know? I mean, oh, it's awful. I don't care where you come from. Yeah, the I'm ACT like, sucks. Come on, man. It's like, why do we do so much to, I don't know, it's like to make us fail over here. But anyway, I took that test like 10 times because it's just so long, man. And I needed the last time I took it, I needed, I needed to make this. I couldn't take it anymore. And I never forget it. I don't know if you talked to Ms. Hall about it, but the letter came to her house and she didn't open it. She gave it to me. And I opened it up. I'm like, oh God, Ms. Hall. She's like, what? She started crying. I'm like, Ms. Hall, we passed. We passed. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> you know? And, and that, uh, that letter, not to bring it down to the, but that unlocked everything for oh, you. Oh man, that was it, Joe. Um, because that's what I was working for. That that was 
that was a a, a, a a son going to his dad and making a great decision. And his his dad believing in him, you know, and um, his hall believing in me. Mr. Parquette, when I got the scholarship, they on my back. You're carrying them all to Miami. Everybody. I wanted to make a name, not only for myself, but for the city so they would go back. So you get to Miami in 97, you redshirt your first year. Yeah, I thought it was the worst thing ever, Joe. You wish you had just gone right in and played? At the time, I did. Was it the right thing for you? No. I, I sprained my ankle really bad two days before we had to report to training camp. I'm sick. I'm like, oh my God, what? This ain't right, you know? So I missed the first couple of days, the swelling went down, and I'm like, man, tape this up, I'm out there. Let's go. I'm out there limping and making plays, and like, you know what? This ain't as hard as I thought. But I'm slow, and I'm getting gaining weight, and coach is like, we red-shirting you, dude. I'm like, red-shirting me? No. No, coach, I can play, man. <laughs> then I'm on the sideline looking at some of my players, my teammates like, oh, no. Oh, <laughs> no. Oh, no. You can put me in a wheelchair, and I can be better than these guys. Really? I mean, that's how it is. You know what I mean? I've never been a guy to doubt my ability. And I'm not a guy to downplay yours, but I'm not going to doubt mine. I know what I could do. And that's all it was. I'm like, man, put me in there. And my roommate from freshman year is Reggie Wayne. Wow. Hall of Fame receiver. He played his freshman year, so he helped me get through it, but that's my brother for life. We like comedians because we can adapt to any situation. Your, your second year you play, yeah, and then in 2000, you guys finish 11-1, and one, but the BCS computer, they keep Miami out of the title game. Yeah, man, nobody likes Miami. Oh, it was, it was a conspiracy. It's still like that to this day, man. Is it? Come on, man, there's a lot of conspiracy going around in this world. And Miami's <laughs> on the list. Oh, number two. Number two. Number two. <laughs> number two. Uh, well, who's number one in the conspiracy? This country. Okay. So it goes, <laughs> in your mind, it goes from the United States of America to the University of Miami football program. Man, don't get me into that, Joe, man. All right, all right. Don't get me into so that. So how important, you don't get the opportunity as a junior to win the whole thing. Yeah. You could have left. Yeah. You were good enough to leave, but how important was winning a national championship for the Miami Hurricanes to you? That's why I went there. Graduate, national championship. Four years I graduated. My senior year, if I come back, which I already knew. You guys were loaded. I have one class my senior year, and all I could do is play football. I got friends in the league, so finance is not a problem. If I needed it, you know? I'm at University of Miami. Finances ain't never been a right. problem. They're paying you anyway. If you need I'm, it. I'm just kidding. I'm just if kidding. If you needed it. I mean, right. that's true for every college state. Nobody in here is stupid to it. Y'all know, as well as I know, there's sharks. They're everywhere around the NCAA. So if you need it, trust me, you can get it. If you're any kind of player, they'll pay for you. They'll so give it to you, you know? You're a... I wouldn't take it enough. All right, maybe one time. All right, yeah. <laughs> I needed a flight home to go get my car. Hey, this is not a deposition. You it's don't, all good now. You've not been injected with truth serum. It's all good. It's all, all right. good. They did something in there. Really? She was putting on some stuff yeah, on my it's face. The makeup. And then she put something on my lips and That's it, it tasted funny. That's, it's the conspiracy. <laughs> We're three. <laughs> Undeniable is number three. That's right, baby. <laughs> All right, so you come back for your senior year. Your team is friggin' insanely good. Yeah. Shockey, Gore, Andre Johnson. Uh, Clint Portis. Clint Portis, Ray, Jonathan Will Vilma. Willis McGahee, Jerome McDougal, Vince Wilfort. You can name a bunch of first-rounders. Antrell Rowe, Sean Taylor, who was behind me, rest his soul. I mean, you had so many wow. guys. Kelly Jennings, Philip Buchanan. No team was going to beat us. Only Boston College was had a chance because it was so damn cold and we Miami boys. Right. That's why the game was always so close. <laughs> you guys had won seven straight. 
You're leading 12 to 7. Yeah. Boston College has got a first and goal. So Ed <laughs> Reed's on the prowl back there on the back end, and here it is. <laughs> Okay, now you claim old number 91 yeah. handed you the ball. <laughs> I claim you being this incredible ball hawking athlete and knowing the situation because yeah. you're smart. No doubt. You said, well, 91 not making it down the field for a touchdown. No way. He looked like he was trying to score. Right. <laughs> Give me that ball, and you took it the rest yeah. of the way. Yeah, I mean, those plays make football. You know, I'm, I'm old school. Sandlot, throw up tackle with everybody in here playing. And there's only one person with the ball. Right. All these people got to tackle you. And believe it or not, y'all wouldn't tackle me. Well, here we go. You're getting ready for a national championship, literally, for the Rose Bowl and mm. Nebraska. Mm -hmm. As the team leader, how do you get your team ready for the Rose Bowl? <laughs> we got them ready after we won in Virginia Tech. If you go back, they got a clip of me saying, look, guys, this is all good, and we can have some fun, but we got one more. We got one more. But they knew we wasn't losing. We, my, our team knew we were on the run to the national championship. Nothing less. And you leave three minutes and 10 seconds to go in the first quarter. Crouch is a burner. Edward Reed, the tackle. This is Crouch coming around the corner. Edward Reed made the tackle. Miami has erased all doubts. They are clearly the national champions of college football in the year 2001. There he is yeah. at the end. So you see, you see me on that clip tackling Eric Crouch every time. That was my only responsibility. He was, was the, Crouch? He was their whole team. They ran the triple option. He was my only responsibility. Nobody else had. It was an interception to worry about because they wasn't throwing the ball. Tackle him every time. And we'll win. They couldn't get it going. 27 nothing. Andre Johnson, you know, Ken Dorsey, MVPs. Our offense was uh, awesome. What did it feel like to be a national champ? I mean, that's why you stayed in school. Man, I can't explain it. I mean, you can imagine dreaming about something and achieving it, like truly achieving that dream that you set out to achieve, something you set out to do, you know, when you went to college. Only thing you truly went to college for is to win a national championship, to bring Miami back to those Miami days and people be like, you're one of those reasons why. That's there. What did your dad say with his boy being a national champion? Oh, man. That was that probably was one of the happiest days of his life, you know, because he didn't get to go to college. He didn't have that opportunity. And, you know, to have that trophy in his house, hmm, I can only imagine how proud he is. Because he, I mean, he's not a man of many words, but, you know, graduate, win a national championship, Potential first round draft pick. Yeah, he was pretty, he was pretty stoked. <laughs> That's great. So you were drafted 24th overall by the Baltimore Ravens. You, you've left this incredible program that you helped put back on its feet at Miami. And if the goal there was to win a national championship, the goal at the next level is to win a Super Bowl. No doubt. Um, when you get to when you get to Baltimore, are you are you a goal setter? Are you somebody that writes down what you want? Mm -hmm. You really? Yeah, you have to. What did you What did you write down when you got to the Ravens? I wanted to be the best DB to come through the NFL. As an individual, as a teammate, I wanted to win a Super Bowl, multiple. If we could, we should have. But you know, conspiracy. No, no, I'm just not teasing. with that one. <laughs> not with that one. You got to have the right components, you know, top to bottom. But that's hard to direct a team in the NFL to success yeah. from the safety position. Somewhat. I mean, you're, you're not the quarterback. Somewhat. 
you are. You're the quarterback of the defense. You're the last line of defense. But you need a lot of other dominoes to fall. Just for, like for the, the team quarterback to be good. does. Just right. like the quarterback does. So who's the most important person on the field? I'm glad we're talking about this. <laughs> are you quizzing me? I'm, I'm quizzing everybody. So who's the most important person on the football field? If we if if the safety needs everybody and the linebacker needs everybody and the D-line needs everybody, so does that quarterback who's making 120 something million dollars too, right? Yeah. So I always had an argument about that when it came to the draft, especially when I was balling in the league. I don't give a shit how much Peyton Manning making Brady and all these guys. I'm saying I can play on the football field with their ass. I don't care if he had a quarterback and I'm at safety. I deserve just as much as he's making. Why? Because I take it from his ass. Oh, yeah. You see what I'm saying? So that you're telling me that the safety spot wasn't as important. I didn't say that. When well, did you, I say that? Roll the tape it, backwards. Repeat what you said. You, 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 I said it's hard to in a team sport yeah. Yeah. to direct a team to overall success, win a Super Bowl, as a safety, as a one-person last line of defense guy. You're saying in the game, right? Because you can't be talking locker room. No, no, I'm not. I'm smarter than that's, that. You, you're not talking locker room where it matters. You're not talking training camp where it matters. You don't talk about taking everybody to a sushi bar on my dime. <laughs> no, that nobody talks about. So we got to find, we had to tweak things, you know? We got to take things out, people out, put things in, you know? Coaches had to be moved. Coaches had to come in. There was other battles, you know? but. As we got older player, other players and younger at the time, now there's, there's a different sheriff running things to some degree in the back. You know, ain't trying to step on nobody's toes. Bless you, ain't trying to step on nobody's toes. Man, you are multitasking out here. <laughs> Answering questions, getting pissed <laughs> off, blessing people in the crowd. But, but you know, it just, it just was, you try to throw things in there to help the team win. Speaking of that, 2004, video against the Browns. Exception return, the longest in history. So, they actually, they actually upped it to 106, which, you know, that it's kind of a guessing game when you do that in the end zone anywhere, where, where you take over, but you could run, man. I mean, it's, it's one thing to be fast, you were fast. Mm -hmm. uh, there are plenty of guys that are fast. Yeah. But it's, it's here. It's being in the right place at the right time. No Tip doubt. ball, you're there, and great hands Thank on you. top of it. That's mm -hmm. normally they put the guys that don't have the great hands on defense and let the guys with the great hands stay on offense. But but you had it all. Remember my remember my softball story about my dad. Shag and fly balls. It all comes back. In 2004, nine interceptions, NFL Defensive Player of the Year. Mm -hmm. It's an individual accomplishment. I know it goes with your team. I'm not saying that. It goes with my brothers. Right. But it's not coming with a Super Bowl champion. No. No. So it didn't even matter. You didn't care. I cared because I know all the work we put in the offseason, me, Monty Sanders, Reggie, I mean, um, Ray Lewis and Monty Sanders. I know all the work I did with Andrew Swayze. I know the lifestyle change from 02, 03 to 04. I caught 100 balls that offseason probably. If, every day I'm just catching balls, jumping out of pool, in the sand, in the ocean, in Jamaica, Puerto Rico. Didn't matter. My advisors was working out with me, and these guys suck. <laughs> <laughs> but they out there giving me the best look possible. Were other teammates frustrating to you that they weren't buying in or they weren't listening or they were doing their own thing or they were... That, I would imagine that stuff drove you nuts. Yeah. We're in the meeting room every training camp. Never fail. Guys in the room, coach explaining the defense, and you're not taking notes. If you're a teacher in here, you say the same thing for your students. You're at the board, and they're not taking notes. How are you going to be, how are you going to remember? You, there's no way you're going to remember this whole playbook. That's no way. So you got guys, first rounders, second rounders, guys who are on the team getting paid, not taking notes. Damn right you're mad, because this is a partnership. This is a business. 
My success depends on yours, so nobody else is important, more important than the next. Nobody. Not that quarterback, not that running back, not that tight end, not God, that you hate quarterbacks. <laughs> you don't like quarterbacks, do you? I do. I used to play quarterback. Yeah, I still okay. think I got some of that in me, man. Uh -huh. but of course I hate him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, but I'm just saying, I just, I don't give a shit if you were a first-round player. I don't care if you got $500 million. Kev, you're the poorest person on the earth. We're all the same. <laughs> Even in sports. So in 2008, John Harbaugh shows up. Yeah. Previously a special teams coach. Mm -hmm. Did you know that he was the right guy at the right time for this team, or was he? I can honestly say no. I can honestly say that it was... It was shaky to know where we were heading. Even though we were having the conversations about where we wanted to go, and that didn't change. And that was winning the championship. That's all Coach talked about. You know, Coach Harbaugh came in like, it's my way at the highway. And we like, Coach, no. And I still feel that way. Some of the stuff he did and how he handled things, I just didn't agree. When you say stuff, I, I don't want you to... Okay, well, let me be clear. Give me, give me. <laughs> let me be clear. Let me be clear, because I don't have a problem with that. Um, <laughs> when Coach first got there, um, we had training camp practice, and he, he's, he's mad because, you know, players are talking about the system and how he's doing things, and, you know, we're an older group, and we know football, and he know we talking. He know we in there frustrated. He know, you know, his system is hard, but he also know his vision which we don't know yet. Coach called everybody up. Y'all come in, come closer. You can imagine us being a team and working towards one common goal and somebody saying, F you if you don't believe in this. F you this, that, we're like, whoa. And I'm the only person, whoa. Loud, whoa, what are you, whoa, what? I gotta get out this huddle. I got to back up out this. I ain't a part of that. No. No. This needs to be nipped in the bud. Coach Harbaugh up there talking to us. He's like, yes, Ed. I said, Coach, so us as a team been talking, us as players, we want to know where you were coming from earlier when you said F us. Because I know I need that offense lineman. I need my D coordinator to be on point. I need Torrey Smith to catch that ball and Quan Bolden to catch that ball that Joe throw to them. I need them. So what are you coming from saying F you? Because we're supposed to be together. I'm working my ass off to come back and you want me to play for you? It ain't gonna happen. Not with that attitude. So after the meeting, he came up to me and we just started talking, man. I believe we got a lot closer after that. And we talked a lot of football, Coach and I. And I got a lot of respect for Coach, but it was shaky. It was like two brothers. It's like two brothers, you know, you have those disagreeing moments kind of in your face where you want to fight him, but that's your brother. And I really, truly believe that about he and I. Like, it was, it was a connection to just something, you know, that, that helped us get over that hump. Harbaugh comes in, and in 08, you guys make it to the AFC Championship game. Yeah. So at least you know... We're moving in the right direction. You're moving in the right direction. Yeah. So can we just show the Philly return, which was not only a great return. It's unbelievable. But it's literally some of the worst tackling I've ever seen <laughs> right. in my life. Here it is. Eagles, the game for Ed Reed. This one, he returns 108 yards. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's the longest in NFL history. Yeah. That, man. Westbrook. He wouldn't have tackled me in a phone booth. Come on. <laughs> All he had to do was push me out of bounds. Just go like that. <laughs> That's it. I gave him no one, too, man. <laughs> I had some moves. I oh, had you some had some moves. moves? I still got the moves. You give me a year, I probably can go and do this again. Bro. 2011, you guys make the AFC Championship game against the New England Patriots. That's Brady's wristband. He wrote... Find 20, you, mm -hmm. in every play. Yeah. 
That meant that when he came to the line of scrimmage, mm -hmm. his last check was, you know, he's calling the play and a little reminder on there that when he got to the line of scrimmage, we always hear, you know, 50's the mic, 50's the mic. You know, you're always trying to identify the middle linebacker. Mm -hmm. But he wanted to know where you were. So I take you back. I'm going to take everybody back to a question that Joe asked me about the quarterback and the, the most important person on the field and all that. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I love it. Give it to me. All right. Uh, you know, that was disrespect, man. You know, he... he, he Who won knew. that game? They won that. Okay. They won that game. They won that game. Um, I should have picked the ball. They threw it to a tight end, rest his soul, that um, I should have just picked it and, and scored. I knocked it down. That was it. That was the last straw. That was the fourth year we lost. And now, by the way... I was done. Well, you're you're going to be 34 years old. Yeah. I'm like, coach, team, we're not going to win a championship. Y'all don't want to win a championship because we got a bunch of lowlifes in here. And they start laughing like some of y'all. It's like lowlifes, really? You can call it lowlifes, you know? And I'm like, yeah, lowlife. Because we got volunteer firemen walking around here cleaning up after grown men, right? My locker, your locker, is two feet from the garbage can. You come off, take, cut your tape off your ankles, your wrists, and instead of you throwing it in the garbage can, where you throw it at? On the floor. I'm like, listen, guys, this is the little things, man. Pick up your towel. You walking out, the dirty bin is right there when you walk out. Why are you leaving that towel in there for somebody else to come in there and clean up? I did it myself because I didn't want the firemen to have to look at my nasty-ass teammates' towels and have to pick them up all the time. I saw the teammates that can vouch for that. And they can vouch for this story because it's true. Super Bowl year. We ain't winning it if y'all don't do the little things. And did you sense a shift? Yes. No doubt. We can't, we, we, we started to come together even more so. I said, we're going to Super Bowl in New Orleans and we're winning it. It's unbelievable. I mean, wow. But you had to take steps to get there. You've made the small thing speech. You get into the postseason again. You have this great double overtime game with the Denver Broncos. Yeah. And you got to be thinking when you win that game, okay, all right, now we're winning a game that maybe in the past we might not have won. Yeah. Yeah. Finding a way to get there. So you get past the New England Patriots. Now you get to the Super Bowl. Yeah. Yeah, it don't matter who we're playing against. They ain't winning. You're playing against San Francisco. Yep, team I grew up watching, my favorite team, Joe, Joe Montana. Montana was Ronnie your guy. Lott. Nobody can script the stuff that I've been through. And part of the script is the Super Bowl of all years is in New Orleans. It's unreal, Joe. I can't tell that story. People won't believe that I grew up in Louisiana five minutes, a bus ride. I mean, a bus ride from the Superdome to go back home in your hometown, stand in a stand in a hotel looking at a river your brother passed in a year ago? <sighs> Nobody won't believe that script. It's your brother Brian. Last thing my city heard about me God darn it, was that my brother passed, you know? And I was standing out there and I remember the cameras being out there and these people just saying all the wrong things as they say and me getting mad and nobody's seeing it. I'm looking at that media person. I'm so mad because I already deal with media in my job and now my brother passed and these people out here and just doing all the wrong things. But when we made it to the Super Bowl, I had already won. I'm in front of my hometown in a stadium I grew up watching Dalton Hilliard, Ricky Williams, and all these guys who are idol. We here. That's a divine hand on this. Who was in the crowd? Who John wasn't? Hall? Who wasn't? Yep. You, you, how, how many tickets you have? Oh, man. Honestly, Steve Bashotti came up to me. The couple, owner of the Ravens. A couple, couple of days before the game was like, hey, you need any extra tickets? I'm like, sure, whatever you got. I'll take him. He's like, nah, tell me what you need. I'm like, I'm like, Steve, listen to me. I can fill up the Superdome. Right. <laughs> there, there is not a number of tickets you can give me that I can't fill. 
I bought a suite, plus I had like 80 or 90 tickets. What was that like coming True. back to the family? I'm pre-gaming, and I see Mr. Parkett and his wife there early. It's my mentor. That's where I think all the energy was at pregame. Because I was out there just seeing all the faces and being home and overwhelmed with excitement. You know, it was... It you was, saw your four parents. Yeah. Yeah. I had already won. So this game is crazy. It's yeah. the Harbaugh brothers going at it on the sidelines. Yeah. Jim against John. Let's yeah. run the first piece of video from Super Bowl 47. And the drop exceptions as the New Orleans native has the pick and a flag is out. And we lost power at half of the stadium. Now, it's no question this delay is going to affect the momentum of this game. That's crazy. You guys are killing them 28 to 6. The game's in the bag. And the lights go out in the Superdome. Now we now we getting back to the conspiracy ad. Oh God. And you there you had that last shot of you like on the field stretching. Mm -hmm. We now know your knees were jacked yeah, you up. Yeah, you can see the you can see the wrap on the left knee. I got a second degree MCL sprain on this knee in the first degree MCL sprain on this knee in the first quarter. Oh, golly, man, how are we gonna get through this? <laughs> oh my God, there's no way I'm going, I can't. Can't tap out. I'm in the game. Now I cut back to when the lights come on, it take old 78 a little longer to get warmed up than those 89s. <laughs> right. <laughs> that was on San Francisco team, you know? Cause they were like, we were older. And whoever hit that switch knew that too. I mean, you hear the commentator, right? You got to listen to him, man. Somebody knows something, somebody did something. It has to benefit San Francisco more than it benefit the Ravens. So if somebody knew something, did it get out of hand? Maybe we cut the lights off and blame it on Beyonce. <laughs> <laughs> Always gets back to Queen B. You know what, actually, she did the halftime show, but you can't blame B, because they was at the party, man. But after the lights go out, yeah. the momentum's gone. Yeah. And now San Francisco comes back. It looks like this. Two point conversion coming up to try and tie the game. Kaepernick incomplete. Ed Reed came blitzing in and influenced that throw. Ed Reed, a hopeful kid from New Orleans. His dream was to come back home and play here in the Super Bowl. It just doesn't get any better than that. And you knew where he was going? Kaepernick was going yeah, on that last play? you watched that throw? last play, you could see. I'm supposed to be running that same blitz you had just saw me run when I came open. But they knew we were running the same blitz. I'm like, Coach, why are we calling this? That's one of the moments when I'm like knowing the defense, like, no, I'm not blitzing. I'm not doing my job here. I got to do something else because I know. And I'm looking at Kaepernick, he looking at me, but he take a look, he take a peek at Crabtree. The ball's going there. If he would have threw that ball right to Crabtree, it would have been a pick by either me or Jimmy Smith. He wasn't catching that ball. Now it comes to back when you're reaching for a goal, when you're reaching for something and you've studied it and you've done your due diligence, believe it. Believe it. Trust, Trust it. it. Jinx. <laughs> Trust it and go. And that's what that was. I, I don't know if you've seen this quote we have on the wall. If we surround ourselves with the right people in the right environment, our opportunity for success increases greatly. Yeah. What does that quote mean to you? We have a choice. And I remember Stan Schofield came talk to us at school about choices and decisions and choices and consequences. To every choice, there's a consequence. And those, those things, it wasn't just John Hall, it wasn't just Mr. Parquet, it was other people like that who would give you a word. I had some choices to make. Because I was in that position to make choices to better myself or go the other way. Were you satisfied or happy with the way things ended with the Ravens? 
I had a lot of gripe for, for, for Baltimore because, because of how they handled me, because of how they let me go. And I say they let me go because I didn't want to leave. You know, coming out of Miami, I already knew the NFL was bad business. I knew there wasn't no loyalty. You know, I knew that already. They'll use you I knew when they I, need you, and then they'll kick you aside. I already knew that. I was at Miami. Miami was to, to some degree like that, like the NFL. So what have you done for me lately? You know, you ain't playing. You, you hurt, you can't help. You get hurt, somebody else stepping in, your ass might get left. That's how Miami was. And cats knew that. You get hurt, you got shot, you're done. Because they got a badass athlete behind you. Thank that, God I got hurt my first year and nobody could take my position. Yeah, they the guys now. will play hurt yeah. knowing that they're going to lose their spot. And by the time they get to the NFL, they're broken down. Yeah, no doubt. We need to look into the programs, man, in which I know we're not going to do. Come on, man. The NFL and the NCAA is like one of the biggest businesses around here, especially the NCAA. Come on, man. You know, there's so much going on that it's just, I ain't saying it's bad or illegal. It's just need to get in order. It's just no different than what's going on in the streets outside these doors when we all take the suits off and stop sitting in the audience and just listen to, you know. Right now, we just blacked out away from all that stuff. Where you're going with this is, is the understanding of the long-term effects of these traumatic mm -hmm. brain injuries, yeah. CTE, you know, the early onset of yeah. some awful diseases, be it Alzheimer's, stuff, Parkinson's, whatever it might so be. So many diseases. I'd heard of disease. I can't remember what athlete was talking about this disease he got, and it, 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 it always brings him to tears. He can't, it's uncontrollable with tears or something. I think I have some of that. As you can see, me sitting here. Well, you've also lived a life. I yeah, mean, of course, but, but that's, that's okay so to be much. emotional. Oh, yeah, of course, but there's so many things that you don't know affects the body, you know, that, that we as human beings thinking we're, we're getting the proper treatment. We, we go to the doctor, and the doctor tells us, okay, what, what's going on with you? How are you feeling? Okay, take this. You'll be okay. While they still messing up something else. So look, we getting treatment and medicines for symptoms. Not the core problem. <laughs> NFL treating the symptoms, not the core problems. This society, government, we treat the symptoms, not the core problems. Knowing what you know now, yeah. you would still sign up for life in the NFL and play the game the way you played yeah. from the safety position. Yeah, because I never played it with intent to hurt anybody. I never played it, you know, to go out there and just, you know, be that guy who takes somebody out. But, but what about, what about self-preservation? What about that was, that was you're it. absorbing? That was it for me. So when you get to the NFL, and I'm sure y'all heard it before, it stands for not for long. <laughs> right? You heard it, right? You've heard it. It stands for not for long because they know what you're going to go through, and that's what the NFL know. They know what we go through, and they still not taking care of us. They know what we go through, and they still giving us a hard time. They know what we go through, and they still full of crap to some degree. It's a lot of great things we do in the NFL. Don't get me wrong. I love my league. I love, I love the fact that it was established, you know, because it gave a young black kid, a young kid, a young kid, a young human being, an opportunity to better himself in this country. And I would do it again with everything I know about the sport. Well, we end this show by asking what's next. I've been having a football camp at my high school since I've been in the NFL, since Coach Robicho called me and asked me to do it. It's been like 14, 15 years. And you have literally, I, I'll say this. I miss one day. One day of the football camp? Yeah. That's it. That's all you've missed. 15 years, one day. I feel like in some ways for as dominant a player as you were in high school, as great as you were in college, as unbelievable as you were at the NFL, the most pride you have about what Ed Reed has accomplished in his life is mentoring young no doubt. kids. Oh, no doubt, you know? You literally have really walked the walk, I think. You can sit out here and talk all you want, but yeah. 
but you've done it and, and you continue to do it. So you, you Thanks, gave whatever, whatever opportunity you were given by mm -hmm. the halls and parquet and your dad saying, okay, you have tried to hand down to new generation. Yeah, that's what it's about. You know, you didn't get here by yourself. Nah. <laughs> I'm not traveling this road by myself still. You know, I still got people who help me, you know, who, who I look to for strength, so to say, you know. And it, and it made me the leader I was through college. Having my dad make those decisions, people like Ms. Hall, Ms. Mr. Parquet, that helped me, you know, those times when I was by myself. You could make the case that you were lucky to end up in Baltimore. I think Baltimore is lucky to get you. Two-way street. We, uh, Two we end this with fun questions. Uh-oh. <laughs> Would you rather have x-ray vision or bionic hearing? X-ray vision or bionic hearing? Ooh. I'm going to go with something I already have, x-ray vision. Don't stare at me like that. <laughs> <laughs> You're nuts. In the best possible way. If you were to have another life, would you rather it be in the past or in the future? Future. Can't change your past and make you who you is. Future is what you're going to. You know, you're bringing your past with you anyway. It makes you who you are, so. Back to the future we go. What makes a great safety? That's my last question what for you. What makes a great safety? Got to listen. Got to communicate. So communication and listening is the key. You can't play football without communication. You can't play any sport without communication. You can't be in a marriage without communication. You can't be a friend without communication. I mean, I don't know how else to put it. You got to talk. You got to communicate. It has to be something every day that you're working on, you know, with your teammate. On the football field, you're going to have my name on your wristband looking for me. That's awesome. I got to tell you, done a lot of these interviews. I've never had more fun sitting across from somebody, Joe, man. Thanks, learning, Joe. talking, uh, reminiscing. Right on, Joe. Uh, somebody who had multiple opportunities to make the wrong decision, to yeah. go the wrong way. Yeah. You end up a credit to all four of your parents mm -hmm. and a credit to the city of Baltimore and a credit to the NFL and just a good, strong man. Congratulations. Well done, ladies and gentlemen. Ed Reed. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you all. Wow. Appreciate it.